We are ready now to present uh, part two of uh, the rotor design <coughs> discussion and techniques for asynchronous induction machines. This is lecture number 21 and I'm Jim Hendershot. The, well, let's start with a summary of the list of the uh, uh, major design consideration. We have to decide first we're going to cast this rotor, fabricate it. We have to select the number of bars uh, uh, and uh, rotor slots versus the number of stator slots. <coughs> we have to select the cage material, aluminum or copper. And then most important, the bar shape itself and, and its uh, location, the slot fit, whether it's skewed or not. And then of course, uh, the air gap between the rotor and the stator enters into this, of course. Next, we have to know what our speed torque requirements are, uh, how we're going to operate this. We assume, uh, by definition of this whole series of lectures, that these this, these rotors are uh, designed for inverter duty, not for uh, fixed voltage and frequencies grid power. We mustn't forget about the thermal expansion issues, uh, differences between the uh, the different materials, the steel laminations, aluminum bars or copper bars, and the end rings. And then we mustn't forget about the stresses, the mechanical stresses due to thermal and due to torsional uh, torque effects. At some diameter, the end rings will need to be extended beyond the core lane to allow for bending stresses on the copper bars to prevent shear stresses on the bars, etc. Otherwise, they'll, uh, if there are shear stresses, they're going to fatigue and fail. Uh, I've noticed that some large machines, are their rating is determined by the number of starts these are grid motors, of course. Now this is a, a picture of a typical uh, uh, rotor punching uh, designed for a vector controlled induction motor or, uh, or inverter duty. Notice the uh, teeth are parallel, the uh, slots are tear shaped, and uh, the slot openings are semi-closed. And the, the teeth tips are not thin, they're quite thick. And the purpose of that is uh, to set those, the, set this angle of the two tips at approximately 45 degrees, and that that gives a lot of strength in the throat here. So that if we can get these uh, bars in there and get them restrained and get them tightened, then at higher speeds in the center of the rotor, the centrifugal force on the bars, which might cause them to bow or bend, they'll be hopefully restrained by these uh, by these uh, two tips. Uh, lamination material, we've talked about that at great length. That whatever applies to rotors applies to, rotor, whatever applies to stators applies to rotors. Uh, semi processed steel with no core plate or fully processed with core plate, and uh, semi processed with core plate and annealed after punching, as long as you use a core plate that doesn't burn off when you anneal it, and the C5 core plate does that. And as you can see here, the color of these indicates uh, which one was uh, which here. The, the, uh, the, uh, the darker one is C, that's semi-processed with a needle after punching. You can, after a while with experience, you can tell by looking at an existing lamp which one of these it is. Now, some machines, the larger machines, have keyways in the bore, and uh, smaller machines don't. They just shrink them right on the, on the shaft. Uh, the, we discussed the slinky construction before. This is a very excellent way to make a rotor. Th this actually shows a, uh, an outside rotor uh, uh, machine, but uh, the same process of whether it's a uh, uh, inside or outside. You save a lot. You, you start with a strip of steel this wide, and with special dies, you, you punch these teeth, and then you wrap it up and roll it up like a slinky toy. And uh, they've even got this automated to the point where the spacing and the wrap and everything are such so that when you wrap this up, they're all aligned, the slots are aligned perfect. It's a beautiful process. It's expensive tooling and it requires maintenance on the tooling and it costs a lot of money to get ready for it, but it's an excellent way to make a, make a stator at low cost. Now, uh, the, uh, we have to select the number of rotor bars. That's, that's important and there's lots of rules and guidelines for that. Uh, most of them that are, have been critical have been single phase machines that 
that can have resonance problems get stuck and won't start with certain inertial loads. But with three-phase polyphase machines, that's not as big a problem. But there are some guidelines you have to go by. And uh, uh, one, one could say that uh, the rotor bar numbers should be about uh, 1.2 times the number of stator slots in. Or it could be 0.8 number of stator slots. can never be the same. Now, uh, the other thing is to, to uh, adequately establish poles in the rotor that will generate uh, sinusoidal uh, voltages in the rotor. You need a certain number of bars. Uh, you can't really do it with one bar per pole. So uh, a, a good rule of thumb is five to seven rotor bars for each pole, at least minimum of that and higher if possible. In larger machines you want to go up to seven, eight, nine rotor bars per pole. And uh, uh, it's a tricky balance with the, these machine designs to get the width of the bar and the width of the tooth uh, optimized so there's no space wasted. But we, we, with the tooth we've got to deal with low speed peak torque flux densities. And you don't want to get to saturation when you're all finished. And uh, in the case of the bar, you've got to, uh, at those same peak torques, you're going to be at maximum current because uh, to create the peak torque, remember the torque producing currents is flowing in the bars of the rotor. So uh, to get peak torques, you need a lot of current. So you've got to have your current densities at acceptable values at, at, as well. And uh, some rotors are skewed, some aren't. Now here's a classical list that we presented this before. Well, it's worthwhile including it in this lecture again for reference. This is a list of uh, by Reliance by uh, uh, by Baldor. They're both owned by ABB now, and this is a list by horsepower of two, four, six, eight pole motors that uh, uh, are the, these are the standard uh, slot and bar combinations that they use and the uh, the highlighting I think is shown on another slide I didn't repeat it here uh, the there's a super efficient ones and uh, and then the normal three levels of efficiency here is what those those codes mean uh, and but but you can you can uh, use various sanity checks for the number of rotor bars to slot Tom Lippo writes in his uh, famous book on induction motor design uh, some uh, things to keep in mind. These cusps he talks about in the torque speed curve due to MMF harmonics, those have to do with uh, single phase machines, but here, here's some guidelines for the number of uh, slots for a stator versus rotor uh, with respect to what makes them noisier vibration. Here's a cogging uh, relationship to avoid and uh, he, he gives his own list here in summary of the stator and rotor slot combinations for by pole. Now I find this list very interesting because, and you can leave it to you to compare it with the Baldor's list on the previous slide, but here's the point about this. Uh, Lippo spent most of his career designing machines for use with inverters, so that's why I think this list is worth, worth uh, considering as viable. And uh, we, we've already uh, studied these in the last lecture series, all these different shapes and, and rotor bars. And here, you certainly want to avoid anything like this, anything like this, anything like this. These aren't bad, but they're awful deep. Uh, this kind of configuration is, is the most suitable, I think, for, for, uh, for inverter duty. The, the only thing you might do is, uh, is uh, use a few more bars per pole than what traditional designs have have uh, have uh, used. Particularly if you increase the number of poles past four, and we've studied that, the uh, seeming restriction of four pole induction machines up to a uh, thousand foot pounds. Uh, here's a uh, a typical uh, uh, plot that's provided in a lot of the literature. You'll see various forms of this that shows the effects of the resistance of the bar rotor. Here's a case where the uh, uh, the rotor has uh, very low resistance, so the the slip is low. That's good. That means the efficiency is high and power factor is high at rated 
rated performance up, up in this region here, but its starting torque is very low. And in some applications, starting torque is not required. So if you're driving this with an inverter, uh, you, you, you really want a higher starting torque. You want something like this, and you're willing to pay for a little, uh, uh, little loss in efficiency and power factor because your slip's going to be higher down where you're loading. Now here, here's a case of a machine with a very high resistance, very high starting torque, but terrible power factor and terrible slip to get some the same load, you see. So uh, the, the point is that, that these uh, configurations of the, these, these configurations here are designed to give you a performance like that, like that, or like that, you see, as we've seen in other slides. But, but for inverter duty, this is the only one you, you, you want. You want a machine like that because you're going to take care of this, this starting torque problem with the inverter. You take care of that very easily by controlling the magnetizing flux, which open loop, run off the grid. The motor can't see control of its magnetizing flux. It's, uh, it's determined by the, the high slip. Whereas with the inverter uh, control, you control the relationship between slip and voltage. So that problem goes away. Now here's a, uh, a composite of all the, I think this includes all the known bar shapes that man's ever tried or done for a variety of different reasons and it's, I find this just amazing what a collection of bar shapes and, and I, don't, I don't think uh, very many of those are useful for inverter duty. Uh, 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 but there might be some of them you could use. Uh, my, you know, my, my guess would be you might be able to use that one. You, I, I suppose you might be able to use this one and this one and maybe these. I'm not sure, you know. But, uh, but there's no guarantees, and the, and the best choice for you requires extensive analysis and even testing. And, and, but, but to get started, let me recommend to get started, to start with use type A, NEMA type A until you, uh, 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 and that, that is this one, this one here with nice tear drape, tear drop shaped slots with parallel sided bars. That's where I would start until you develop your own uh, optimization techniques and so on. So let's talk about some guidelines for adjustable speed drives, rotor bar designs for adjustable speed drives what ADS stands for. Uh, you, you want to position the bars as close to the rotor OD to minimize leaking reactants. Uh, the, uh, the, we, we don't have to worry about high resistance starting torque and all of that. We're going to take care of that with the inverters, I just said. Now the die cast rotors can use semi-open slot and, and cast the conductors and fill the slot openings right up to the OD. And you can even finish the OD. Uh, you know, take a cut of the OD after it's cast after it's shrunk on the shaft. The, uh, I think the tooth tip angles in your lamination design should be, uh, uh, shouldn't be real thin. We don't want them to saturate, but uh, on the other hand, we want them to be thick enough to provide some mechanical bar retention. The, uh, the, uh, further than that, the bars have to be retained in the slot to prevent vibration and fabricated cores. Uh, and uh, it's, it's seldom a problem with cast rotors. Swaging is used for bar retention, brazing in place for bar retention, and, uh, and, and I, I believe that bars can be re retained with vacuum applied high temperature adhesives. I think that's a very good way. Some of those adhesives even have excellent dampening characteristics. And I recommend the use of at least six bars per pole for four pole machines. And, 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 and higher for uh, larger machines and higher pole numbers. Increase the number of bars per pole when, with increasing power. Use FDA analysis to, f to uh, determine final bar selection and shape for max efficiency and power factor. I mean, you start with the, the, your best guesses and then you, you, it's trial and error FEA analysis to uh, predict what the right results, which you eventually have to value, validate with hardware. Anyway, here's some more guidelines. Um, the adjustable speed drives are going to use either constant volts to hertz control or flux vector DQ axis control. And the most dramatic improvements, inverter fed 
induction machines is achieved by optimizing the rotor slot and the bar quality shape and the bar material itself going from aluminum to copper. Inverter fed induction motors motor starting conditions are soft as compared to grid powered motors as I've indicated before. This results in much smaller radial loading forces on the bars during startup and acceleration. Uh, however, the bars must be tight in the slots and not prevented to vibrate. Uh, here I repeat the bar uh, rotor bar frequency uh, again, which was in the last tutorial. Uh, this vibration is caused by high current forces on the bars. If, and, and if the bars are loose, they will work hard over time and break. And these, these vibration, these, these vibration uh, uh, forces caused by high current forces, those are caused during startup of a grid powered machine. Uh, for example, the uh, I don't know if I state this elsewhere or not, but those starting currents can be 650 percent of the rated current, so that causes tremendous forces on those on those bars, torsional and uh, inertia forces on the end rings, and and with uh, and with an inverter driving the same machine, the starting currents are only like 150 percent of rated, 200 percent, 300 at the most. But uh, even that can be ramped. In addition, these thermal stresses in the bars do the temperature variations within each bar from top to bottom of the bar. Here's an example. Here's a published example I found of a of a grid motor that uh, they measure 250 degrees C in the bar close to the slot opening, 25 degrees C in the bottom of the slot and the gradient extended to 100 degrees C in the center of the bar. That's a tremendous gradient of temperature from the top of the bar to the, you know, in, in, in the length of the bar. Uh, so uh, uh, the, the, these kinds of thermal stresses aren't near as severe with an inverter-driven uh, machine. Happily, we can happily conclude that um, because of the uh, ability to control the uh, frequency and the voltage in the magnetic current. Oh, here's where I state that the grid powered machines see rotor bar starting currents high, 650 percent of rate of current versus 150 percent of rate of current for inverter driven machines. Uh, the, uh, during grid starting from zero speed, the starting, the starting current flow is in the upper part of the bar close to the rotor OD due to the skin effect of the current penetration. As the motor increases speed, the bar current is distributed down into the lower part of the bar, and the, and the frequencies, because the frequencies seen by the bar decreases as, as it goes faster. So, but this is typical of the control with the with an inverter. This means that the life of the bars is based on the number of motor starts when powered by fixed voltage and frequency from the grid, which shouldn't be a limitation with inverter duty. The starting situation is not such an issue with inverter-fed machines because the skin effect is mitigated because of the continuous control of voltage and frequency. The skin effect is not a factor either anymore because the bars are never exposed to high frequencies causing high slip during startup. Here's uh, some rotor bar choices for these fabricated machines. You can use aluminum with hard anodized coating, aluminum with no surface coating, aluminum with light anodized coating, and copper without anodized coating. These can be extruded uh, or, uh, or rolled. Uh, the uh, rotor cooling issues are quite, uh, quite serious because of the ohmic losses in the rotor. Uh, they produce very low iron losses due to the low slip, at least in inverter duty motors, because you're controlling the slip at all times. So, so the iron losses are less in inverter duty motor than a grid motor that is subjected to many starts and stops. But the uh, the uh, the inverter duty motors do produce significant heating from ohmic losses because you're you have a tendency to utilize the motor at higher currents at lower speeds because you can control the magnetizing flux so that, uh, that that means you're on average through the use of the motor you're going to uh, put more current in the motor more of the time or in the rotor um, and since there's only one turn per phase the current in the rotor is pretty high uh, the entire rotor is mounted in bearings and that's the only contact from the source of the heat of the rotor 
is through air around the rotor, of course, but the other the other thing is the uh, is through the the contact of the balls to the races to the to the shaft to the so so uh, the diffusion pass for the heat sources is not a happy one and it's long. Uh, so uh, but it's still tempting to use an existing uh, lamination because it's cheap and it's available even though the tooth of the rotor and the tooth shape and the slot area were not optimized for use with IM applications because of this current. So so you want to start with uh, the NEMA type A, that's your best bet if this is the case, don't try the other ones. Either the, what happens with the wrong uh, slot area is either the current density is too high or the tooth flux density is too high for the peak torques. Either way, the machine is going to be limited by the uh, rotor heating. And uh, the, uh, if the current density is excessive, and a, a good uh, number to think about is shoot for continuous 5 to 6 amps per square millimeter, or a little higher maybe. You can run the peaks higher than that, but uh, not continuous, unless you have some serious cooling. And uh, it seems that for induction motors to compete with permanent magnet machines, you have to use serious cooling. Small die-cast aluminum machines have crude fan blades cast into the cage, not very efficient, and uh, they circulate cooling air, but that benefits both the rotor and the stator, and it still uh, adds a lot to the continuous power rating. But special cooling systems utilizing the cage to focus circulating uh, uh, outside forced air cooling, such as uh, air inlet deflectors around the shaft, I think we have a picture of that in slide 217. The numbers didn't change since I made this slide. The cooling vents are fabricated into the rotor cores to improve direct air cooling and shorten the thermal diffusion path. Those are those cooling vents in the stator and the rotor that we have showed you many times. The most effective method to cool an induction motor is through the use of an external blower ducted into the machine to cool the rotor and the stator. That's an external motor mounted on a totally enclosed motor with an inlet and an outlet. And, and, and uh, but this is a uh, this is a is a loss. There's no question about it. It's a double loss. It's a loss in the machine that's creating the heat that has to be cooled. Then the further loss to the grid is the power it takes to drive the blower to 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 cool the the uh, motor. So uh, the other way is to, uh, the other uh, very, uh, just as effective way, if not more effective, is uh, is the liquid cooling of the rotor and spray coating and things like that. We'll study that in a later lecture, but, uh, but that has its whole set of problems too. But high performance machines for vehicle traction uh, will use splash or spray coating directly on the rotor and the end rings. Here's a uh, uh, example of, of a machine that uh, has a, a fan mounted uh, on it to, uh, to take air that's sucked into the end frame and, and, and properly deflected. Here's another example of an of a inlet uh, air deflector that's uh, uh, mounted to the shaft, on the shaft, in front of the rotor, so that when the, uh, uh, this fan causes uh, the fan at the end of the rotor, and it could be shaft mounted or cast part of the end, will, will, uh, will, will create a vacuum here. A vacuum is created under here because this is a centrifugal fan. So a vacuum will be created here. So with a, an air deflector like this, that causes air to be sucked in this deflector. Without the deflector, it would be sucked out here. But with this deflector, and if I have a, uh, uh, a fin frame, end frame, like we saw on the last slide, that will cause outside air to be sucked into there and, and set out here. There has to be a place for that to go, of course. And then, of course, this deflare also, deflector also, if there's holes in the lambs here, this allows that, that, that uh, there's a vacuum created here as this spins too. So, so the air deflector allows air to be sucked into these passages and cooler. In that manner, there's a very effective way. Uh, the forces on a rotor, here's a summary of all the forces on a rotor. Uh, 
that's kind of an interesting summary that's worth analysis and study by your mechanical engineer. Counterparts. Final comments on rotor design. The leakage reactor is made of some of the following. A rotor differential, rotor end leakage, and current skin effects in a rotor bars. These calculations are going to be approximated by using Professor Bolday's methods. Uh, FEA methods, although not faster, result in more accurate performance predictions due to the difficulty of calculating leakage reactants. If output torque versus current is too low, assuming the machine is, you have to assume the machine is, is large enough, the rotor leakage reactance is too high, so rotor slot shaping and radial location of the bars must be improved, and you might have to even improve the stator slot modifications. The rotor tooth versus the slot width must be balanced for current uh, to produce peak torque and, uh, and enough flux to produce uh, enough uh, not excessive flux density in the tooth part to, uh, to produce the torque. So if the rotor resistance is too low, increase the slot and the bar width. Use thick end rings is good practice for inverter powered IMs. I'll pose a question why, but I said so later before that. Now there's a, there's a, a phenomenon that uh, uh, that exists in uh, in rotors. There's a uh, a cross path resistance that develops in rotors at higher frequencies. Inverter fed uh, machines operating at higher speeds produce cross path resistances in trapezoidal shaped bars, which are the bars we want to use anyway. This probably is a problem at 500 hertz and higher. Uh, so these extra rotor losses caused by these cross path resistances because the bars are uninsulated from the core, and there's really no ins way to insulate them from the core. So you're stuck with this, and this leads to stray load losses. A further, a further discussion and analysis of this beyond the scope of these lectures, uh, 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 even though parallel teeth permit the best bar shape, uh, it gives us these uh, traps or shaped bars. But there are several uh, IEEE articles on these studies for your reference. Here's one of them, IEEE number there. You can look that up. The title is The Effect on Cross Path Resistance Between Adjacent Rotor Bars on Performance of Inverter-Fed High-Speed Induction Machines. Included in this paper is a formula for the, the affected rotor bar height versus frequency. And it's given by this formula in the, uh, in the legend there. So uh, leave that for your reference and your own analysis. And I believe that concludes this lecture.